eight years ago this weekend, we had a four o'clock in the afternoon, I believe it was four o'clock in the afternoon, that's what it was, for my installation. So that was a lot of gold. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We're glad you could be here today. A happy Pentecost to you all. And uh, today we'll join the Pentecost celebration. Uh, with that, we begin with the first hymn. Please you. 
Into your hands I commit my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. You sing. Holy Spirit, at you and then prescribe some medicine and then you mom and dad take that to the pharmacist and then the pharmacist gives you the medicine and then your parents at home give that medicine to you right well in some ways we can look at God that way you know God wants us to come to him whenever we have any problems or troubles, even when we're sick. He says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Well, so how does he do that? Well, picture God the Father, kind of like the doctor. He knew that you and I and everybody else were sick because we all inherit this disease called sin. And we show it every day, don't we? By sinning against God and others. So God came up with the prescription. God the Father came up the, with the prescription that his son, Jesus, would come to this earth, suffer and die for our sins, and then rise again from the dead. So now God the Son, Jesus, who's like the pharmacist, went ahead and fulfilled that prescription. He went ahead and came to this earth, lived and died for us on the cross, paid for our sins, and gives us eternal life through believing in him. But you and I would never believe in him if we didn't somehow get the medicine in us. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He's kind of like our parents. He makes sure that we receive the medicine, that we believe in Jesus, our Savior, and then continue to live with him now and forever. So God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together to make sure you believe and I believe and others believe in him. Well, today is Pentecost. And on that day, the Christian church was really born when God the Holy Spirit was poured out on the early Christians. So, today especially, but every day. Thank the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all of what they do for us. God the Holy Spirit was poured out on the early church and they then proclaimed Christ crucified and risen and the church grew. Our first lesson is from Acts chapter 2 beginning with the first verse. When the day of Pentecost came, they, that is the disciples, were all together in one place. 
Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, <coughs> visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God. God the Spirit gives us the gift of faith, but also blesses us individually with different kinds of gifts. We hear this in our epistle lesson for today, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, beginning with the first verse. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working. But in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. This is the word of God. We continue now with the next hymn.
come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts in the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the, glo and the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And having heard the word of God, we confess our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear now the words of our gospel lesson for this Pentecost festival recorded in John chapter 7, beginning with verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who has thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, whom we know due to the Holy Spirit, you and I celebrate lots of different events in our lives, birthdays, confirmations, graduations, <laughs> weddings, family reunions. Let's party, we used to say, and we meant to gather for one of those events. Unfortunately, these days it usually means bring out the booze and the drugs. Not quite what we should be thinking. Well, the apostle Paul had something to say about this to the Ephesian Christians. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, to wild living. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. In other words, don't get drunk on spirits, get drunk on the Spirit. Today, we drink in the Holy Spirit as we join the Pentecost celebration. This event of our text actually took place at the feast or festival, not of Pentecost, but rather the festival of tabernacles or tents. It was one of the three great festivals that the Jews, the Israelites, were to go to uh, Jerusalem and worship the Lord together every year. There was, of course, the feast of Passover, you know, which took place in late March or early April and uh, coincides with our celebration of Easter. Recall how Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. Passover took place on the first weekend following the first full moon of spring. And it's for that reason that we also celebrate Easter on the first Sunday after the first full moon of spring to this day. Well, then there was the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost. That was a, a harvest celebration in springtime, and late spring, May, June, right in this time frame, 
it took place 50 days after Easter and that, or after Passover. Uh, and so that's why it's called Pentecost. Uh, they, and it, they thank the Lord for the grains and also for the new grape harvest from their many vineyards. Today is 50 days after Easter, and so now today we celebrate Pentecost. Uh, as we heard in our readings, during Pentecost, tens of thousands of people from all over the world gathered to celebrate the Jewish Holy Day, and the Holy Spirit was poured out on all of those Christians then. Well, the event before us, however, took place in the third of the Holy Days of the Jews, that was in September or early October normally, when the Jews celebrated this Thanksgiving of a harvest of grains and wine once again to remember specifically the Lord's abiding presence and his protection for them. Uh, we set aside this weekend as a time in our country to remember those who served our country in particular. Well, in a very similar way, the Jews then remembered their travels in the wilderness for 40 years. And so the Lord commanded them to celebrate the festival of tents. Uh, most of them didn't have quite these nice tents. Uh, they, you know, they set up little shacks for themselves or some kind of a tent of canvas. But everyone was to move out of their houses for the week and celebrate remembering the 40 years in the wilderness that the Israelites had gone through. That's just the way it was. And it's still celebrated to the, this day among the Jews. During this festival, the high priest would sacrifice a bull on Yom Kippur on the great day of atonement. And he would pour out blood and sprinkle blood on the people and on lots of different places. And it was that one time per year when the high priest and he only could enter the most holy place of the tabernacle, later the temple, and to make atonement for the sins of the people with the blood that was shed. Another sacrifice was also involved on that day involving a goat, the scapegoat. The high priest would place his hands on the goat's head and symbolically place the sins of all the people of Israel on that goat. And then that goat was led out into the wilderness to die. In the same way, John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away, literally it says, carries away the sins of the world, pointing to the same scapegoat. Well, that day the high priest also poured a mixture of water and wine into a from a, a gold bowl into two silver perforated bowls while the people chanted from Isaiah 12, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So it was on the very last day of that festival in what we would say was fall that Jesus stood up and shouted to everyone, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Here were the real wells of salvation. It was such an important message that he shouted it above the dims of the tens of thousands of people that were gathered there at the temple. And now think of how that relates to our text, which happened at a different time of year, 
50 days after Passover. But Peter, above the din of the crowds that had gathered because they had heard this sound of a violent wind, the crowds that were all confused because they were hearing these different languages being spoken, Peter addressed them all and wanted them all to know that the Jesus whom they had crucified was the very one who had risen from the dead. The Holy Spirit had led them to that very spot that day so that all those people could hear Peter's message. Then Peter and his disciples were the ones that God the Holy Spirit was using at that moment so that they would hear that Jesus quenches your spiritual thirst. But why thirst? What do we thirst for? God the Holy Spirit leads us to see that. You know, by nature, Job's friend Eliphaz was right when he said that man by nature drinks up evil like water. By nature, you and I don't desire to do what God wants us to do, but rather wants us, it leads us, our own sinful nature leads us to want to do what is against God. That is evil in God's sight. That's why the Bible also says that we're dead in our transgressions and sins. Or in the words of Ezekiel, that we have dry bones in need of thirst. And Jesus told his disciples, the world hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. To this day, that's not very popular. You, you, you look at some of the big mega churches, they don't tell people very often that they're evil, that they are sinning against the Lord. It's not popular. It wasn't then, it still isn't. But that's the kind of evil that you and I thirst for. Because despite the fact that we're Christians now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we still have a sinful nature, don't we? And that sinful nature doesn't want anything good. That sinful nature wants us to drag us down all the time into evil, into bad, into things against God instead of for him. It's only the Holy Spirit that leads us to want to, to thirst for forgiveness and life in Christ. Many, many years ago, I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Mission, South Dakota. And if you've ever, <laughs> on the rarity that you ever went to Mission, South Dakota and drank a glass of water, you would know that the water in Mission, South Dakota is the most wonderful water you could ever drink. Why, if you finish a glass that's 12 ounces or 16 ounces, you'll want to have another one right after it. And when you finish that one, you want to have another one. It's delicious water, but it has a problem. It's soft water. And so it never quenches your thirst. It has none of the minerals in it that your body says, okay, I've had enough now. Instead, you, it just leaves you wanting more and more and more of it. It never quenches your thirst. Well, Jesus is just the opposite of that. Jesus quenches your thirst and mine for forgiveness, for eternal life somehow, to be right with God. We would never find that on our own. We would always thirst for more. But instead, God gives that to us in Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that leads you and me, just as he led the crowds on that Pentecost day, to know that they needed this, that they really thirsted for it. 
And so we hear Peter's sermon in part, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so we're told when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other disciples, brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Use that water again. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So he pointed to Jesus, the water of life that we all need. And in an awesome way that day, 3,000 people were baptized and came to believe in Jesus. Well, my dear friends in Christ Jesus, if you and I look at ourselves carefully, we come to realize that too often we thirst for the wrong things. We're religious, but not necessarily Christian by nature. We tend to go for going through the motions instead of actually thinking about what we're saying and doing. As proof of that, when was the last time you said the Apostles' Creed or the Lord's Prayer and thought about every word? I don't know about you. I know myself. And it's very difficult to think about every word. Well, then I'm just going through the motions. That's not the way it should be. At Pentecost, the Pentecost crowd, then and now, needed to hear from God the Holy Spirit about what he does at, and did for them then and does for us now in leading us to the water of life that really quenches our thirst for forgiveness of sins. He, the Holy Spirit, leads us to Jesus, who quenches our spiritual thirst. Then the Spirit uses you to invite others to drink. Up to this point, the crowd was confused. They didn't know who Jesus was, really, nor did they know what he had done for them. Some saw him as a good man. Others saw him as a deceiver of people. Some saw him as a healer and miracle worker. Some even saw him as the prophet that Moses had foretold. Most did not recognize him as the Christ, God's chosen one to rescue us all from our sin and from death and from the devil. Even the apostles had been confused prior to this until now. Oh yes, some had given the testimony, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, but they didn't realize what the Christ was supposed to do. They were still thinking that somehow Christ had, would come to rescue them from Roman rule and to somehow be their king here on this earth. And so we even hear them ask, right before Jesus was going to ascend into heaven, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, you and I might very well snicker at their ignorance or wonder about it or even ask the question about that. And Yet we know what Jesus had said. The kingdom of God is not here or there, but is within you. They should have known that. He had said it earlier. So we'd ask, why didn't Jesus set them straight? Because he knew how little they knew and how little they could understand until after the Holy Spirit would come. 
he had told them, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The reason Jesus didn't set them straight is because they wouldn't have been able to understand until the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. You and I wouldn't understand either, except that the Holy Spirit is within us as well, leading us to understand, leading us to see that what Peter said in his sermon was correct. By the Spirit, we know that by Jesus' resurrection from the dead, he was placed on David's throne and now is exalted to the right hand of the Father with all glory and power and majesty. We know this. We know that he has an eternal kingdom because of God the Holy Spirit. So, on Pentecost, the prophecy of Jesus himself in our text was fulfilled. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. But now he had been glorified. He'd been raised from the dead, glorified. He now ascended into heaven. And just a few days later, poured out the Holy Spirit on all those people so that they would believe God's truth and understand God's truth. God's water of life not only came to them, but also became in them streams of living water that flowed out to others. To others then, on that day. To others throughout all the generations after them. To you and to me, now. All flowing from the apostles and the disciples of that time. God the Spirit is still actively creating more disciples for Jesus all the time, in and through you and me. And so he is still working miracles of forgiveness of sins, of understanding the scriptures, of testifying of Jesus to still more through you and me to other people as well. I recall at a much younger age, someone said to us, the Christian church is always only one generation away from extinction. The Christian church is always only one generation away from, dis from extinction. When I look at America today, when you look at America today, I don't think our generation did a very good job of passing it on to the next. You know, that revolution that we took care of back in the 1960s, all it brought was decay for America and a lot of extra troubles and a falling away from the Lord. You know, in the 1970s, roughly two-thirds of America, whether they went to church or not, two-thirds of America believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Now it's not even one-third. What has happened? I don't think we've been very good streams of living water flowing out to others. So how can we change that? How is it possible? Well, we on our own can't, but we with the Holy Spirit can. 
We need to dig deeper into the wells of salvation and draw from that the living water ourselves so that we're able to spill it forth for others. The closer you and I get to the Lord, the more we also are able and willing and eager to pour out the waters of life to others that they too will learn from us of what the Holy Spirit is doing for them. And in the process, more and more will come back to faith. The early disciples said, we cannot but help but speak what we've seen and heard. You and I have seen and heard it too. Oh, that we use that powerful word of life that has been worked in us through the Holy Spirit to reach out to so many more. To quench our own thirst for forgiveness in life and to quench theirs as well. Join in that Pentecost celebration. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We sing the next hymn. Sanctified and kept me in the true faith, 
In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. Holy Spirit, all-seeing counselor and fountain of all spiritual gifts, stand by us in the weakness of our sinful flesh. Grant us a right understanding of the truths that Jesus taught. Give us strength to endure with patience whatever afflictions God may send into our lives. Help us, intercede for us, train us, that we may pray to the Father with boldness and confidence. Preserve us by the power of your word in our most holy faith as members of the church, the body of Jesus, where there is forgiveness for all. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. Holy Spirit, highest comfort in every need, in these gray and last days of the world, strengthen the feeble hands, steady our weak knees, encourage our fearful hearts, remind us of your word and promise, be strong, do not fear, your Lord will come again, he will come to save you. And in all and in your final mighty creative act, O Holy Spirit, raise up our bodies so that we, together with all the saints, may lift up our heads and with glorified eyes see our Savior drawing near. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And now before we close with our final hymn, I know that tomorrow is Memorial Day. I'm not exactly sure which day is Armed Services Day. I know there's one though somewhere in the year. And I know there's Veterans Day in November 11th. But at this point, I just feel like we, since it's Memorial Day tomorrow, we should be remembering all those who served on our behalf. Would those men and maybe women here too that served in the armed services please rise? Right now. Let's thank the Lord for them with applause. And with that, you may now be seated. With that, we will conclude with the hymn, uh, typically not actually known as the Navy hymn, but nonetheless, it serves all the forces. <laughs>
good morning to you all. Uh, I, I call attention to the announcements here. First of all, there will be a congregational meeting scheduled for Thursday, January, uh, June 8th at 7 p.m. And uh, we'll have our president talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Please note that if you want to register for Taste of Mission, do so online. It's on June 10th. And uh, we also have planned now Summer Fellowship Game Night Series here. And uh, the first one of those will be on June 16th. Uh, and, uh, and I really believe that it meant to say croquet rather than crochet, the way the original uh, sign said. So I did change, make that change. Uh, and and uh, also bingo. Uh, and uh, so I seven twelve made it brewers. Then today, of course, Bible class, Sunday school, and tomorrow remember. Okay, and then next week, oh I intended to be erasing that and Sunday school because I think this is gonna be the end of the Sunday school and forgot to do so anyway then. And with that uh, first off, you may have seen some of these envelopes in the back table. Uh, Chris Collins and I, a couple weeks ago, stopped at the bank and we set up a money market account. Uh, it's a savings account for building improvement. So um, you have an opportunity to give to that fund if you wish. It's a money market account. Uh, so we're earning a little bit of interest on that. There's about $10,000 in that account right now. Uh, the second point here is the uh, calling process. We did uh, ask for a seminary student uh, graduate for our pastoral opening that's gonna happen, and we did not get that. Um, as you see in your announcement, there were uh, 100 requests uh, submitted for new graduates. There were 18 right out of our synod, or our district, Western District, and uh, four of those churches got the uh, seminary graduate. <coughs> um, so what that means for us is on June 8th, we have a call meeting scheduled, and we're gonna have our district president, uh, Pastor Jensen, coming to that, and he'll come with three names uh, for us to consider. Uh, we won't have those names ahead of time, they will arrive on the day of that meeting. And that meeting is June 8th at 7 p.m. And that will be here. So that's a Thursday evening. Um, we chose that because of their lack of availability. Um, they're very busy with calling and that was the soonest that we could get them in. Uh, otherwise, we'd have to wait till probably July timeframe. And that's, you know, that, that's getting out there a little ways. So we decided to do that. Um, but I wanted to give you folks the, the update as to where we are on this uh, process. And um, we're not, it's not that we're trying to push the pastor out in any way, but we have to be responsible for our congregation and get the process going here. So um, those are the two announcements I have for you. Any questions? All right. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Could we get a list of who pastors? Are we then to decide which one we would choose to call? Yes, we'll actually call somebody that evening. We'll, that evening. we'll actually decide on somebody um, as a congregation. So we'll vote on that. Okay, is it only the men that are voting for a pastor? Yeah, that's a, right, yeah, everybody can come to that pass. and we can have a discussion, but the voting is reserved okay. to the, uh, But the women are entitled. Of course. Any other questions? By the way, not only did he, you know, comment that we weren't trying to rush me out of here, but I'm the one that encouraged him to have the meeting as soon as possible, you know, because after all, otherwise it takes that much longer. So, um, so anyway, um, pray for us and yeah. God will 
leave in the way he wants us to go.